We're a bit like fish in water. Uh, we're trying to do something different, but we're immersed in our own historic experiences and our understandings of how to make things happen. But I'm sure, as many as you suspect, um, you know uh, that uh, we are trying to do two things um, here today. One is uh, deal with the uh, um, degradation that is happening, the destruction that we know is imminent, and the human suffering uh, that we know is going to come with the collapse of what uh, Kenny referred to as two important systems, the environmental and the economic. We're trying to do two things out of that. One is to lessen the amount of human suffering that's going to occur from that, and the second is to help grow what's new that's happening. So I'm hopefully going to be able to give you some uh, inspiration and insight about the growing of the new. It's with something that I call global action networks. These are like traditional innovations happening on the periphery of power today, the power centers and power structures as we know them. But all of those power centers and structures are in being embedded in them. This is transcendence of the power structures um, as we know them. So the uh, important thing about global action networks is that I think they present some key lessons for us and our challenge that we're facing today. But to understand what they're about, uh, we have to, first of all, go back into history and organizational history. And in the 19, uh, 1850s, there was a very important uh, technological revolution that occurred. It was the invention of the railway. And this invention of the railway actually caused the seeds of our current corporation, business corporation, to be grow, to grow. So for the first time, business had to synchronously uh, work across time zones. It had to transport a previously unimagined number of people and amount of goods. And it created incredible structures to be able to reach those challenges. And out of that, we have uh, the corporation, really, that we have today. But at that time in the 1850s, when that innovation was developing, we had, uh, in, with government, uh, governments that were largely preoccupied with very modest uh, services, uh, the provision, that were occupied with national security, with trade, very minor government organizations compared to what we have today. 1914, First World War, millions of people had to be mobilized, Government bureaucracy had to be able to address their mobilization and how to feed and equip them. Following the First World War, there were new expectations that citizens had for their governments. And by 1950, we had the outline of today's current welfare state, with new types of approaches to education, to health care, to pension systems, to social security. So we had, by 1950s, a new type of government with previously unimagined power. At that time, social, civil society organizations, I'll refer to them as NGOs, although I know popularly here in the United States they're more often referred to as nonprofit organizations. Thank you. Um, in the 1960s, there were two things that were starting to happen. One is that people around the world were coming together to be able to realize certain human values, such as human rights, such as a fair economic development. And at the same time, there was a crisis that started to emerge that you're all, we're all familiar with today called the environmental crisis, which led to the development of NGOs, non-governmental organizations, of unprecedented scale and complexity. So when you look back at the 250 years up to the end of the beginning of this last uh, this millennium, it's a period of development of incredible organizations that we would never have thought 150 years before we could have done. So we have this enormous ability to respond to organizational innovation. But um, these mental models that are behind these organizations are all distinctive. 
So we have uh, an individual entity with some sort of control structure at the top, and we have everyone reporting up to it. The s s sitting on that uh, control structure and getting it to squish out would give you this type of one-dimensional network. So I don't want to confuse you with understanding what I'm talking about networks. I'm not talking about this type of one-dimensional network, which maintains a center and periphery. So um, we had these organizations develop, and then in the 1970s, we started to have cr crisis arise that these organizations have proven themselves patently incapable of responding to. We had economic crisis, challenges through OPEC, leaving the gold standard, inflation, um, unemployment, etc. We had political crisis. Indeed, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that we're at the end of the era of the democratic liberal uh, project. Governments cannot do what we had hoped that they would be able to do. We have the obvious environmental crisis with climate change and a whole range of degradations in diversity and quality of environmental care. We have social crisis. We are increasing the inequality in the world. We have unfortunate uh, decline in standards and indicators on a whole range of factors. So you can look at global action networks being that type of innovation which is arising in response to those types of crises. This is a list of some of them that I'm familiar with and work with. Uh, are there any here that you recognize? What ones do you recognize here? I'd like to get the sense of uh, where people's orientation is. FSC? FSC? Microcredit? Okay, great. So what I'm suggesting here is that this is an institutional innovation that allows us to do things that we never thought of doing before. It's as different, these organizations are as different from business as business is from government, as government is from NGOs. And it's a mistake to think of them as sophisticated NGOs. We have to appreciate the difference to be able to give it real life. So let's go into some of them just in a very brief detail to give you a sense of what they're like. Many people said the FSC, certainly it started partly here on the West Coast. Uh, it started in 1993 when three different groups came together, were unhappy with what was happening with the forest degradation, and wanted to take action to be able to realize forest sustainability and sustainable forest practice worldwide. There were three critical groups, one was business, one was socially focused NGOs, mainly from southern or developing countries, and one was environmental NGOs, mainly from northern countries. They said we've got to transcend our individual differences and be able to do something to be able to create a different future together. Today, about 6% of uh, forests in production are certified by FSC, and perhaps more importantly, 18 to 20% of uh, forest products traded globally are FSC certified. Transparency International was founded about the same time around the issue of corruption. They have uh, probably gained the, gained the greatest reputation around their perception, uh, their corruption perception index, which rates individual countries on the basis of their corruption. But they undertake a wide range of activities to be able to combat <coughs> corruption. When they were formed in 1993, the common belief was that corruption is just part of some cultures, and you actually can't do anything about it, and it's disrespectful to try to do something about it <laughs> to those cultures. Um, today, uh, it's well recognized that co corruption is unacceptable in any culture. <laughs> The UN Global Compact was formed at the beginning of this millennium. It was formed in response to pressure uh, to be able to reform the UN. It's like a skunk works in organizational development language. It's a space that was created by Kofi Annan for, with $10,000 given to a couple of fellows that he trusted. George uh, Georg Kell, who is currently executive head of the Global Compact, and John Ruggie at Harvard. And he said, uh, let's create a space with the UN uh, imprimatur, but let's create it outside of the UN bureaucracy and all of those uh, rules and regulations that are inhibiting us from doing what we really think we've got to do. 
to, do, to realize life in the core UN principles around human rights, corruption, the environment, and labor. This has grown into a global network, 8,700 members, uh, corporate and other organizations. It's multi-stakeholder. And it creates learning forms and uh, undertakes initiatives to integrate these principles into the working of these organizations. So what do these uh, organizations have in common that's different than the other organizing model? Well, for one thing, they embrace a large number of independent entities. They are inter-organizational networks. This creates accountability to a collective value of stakeholders. They are multi-hub. That is, they organize themselves around geographic hubs. For instance, Transparency International has a hub of, uh, in Bangladesh that includes about 300 village-level entities that are working on the issue of corruption. They organize themselves around uh, issues as well, hubs around issues. For example, the Global Compact has hubs working around each of its principles. They are focused upon large system change. So large meaning global, and large meaning transformation. We aren't talking about simply scaling up what the current system is already doing. It's about innovation and understanding how to create the new. They are doing this by bringing together organizations and individuals in those organizations who are committed to the innovation. It's not about a trade association and trying to get mass membership in those associations. They, have a, they are creating coherence to be able to bring out coordination, to be able to create synergies, to reduce redundancy and duplicative effort. And they are multi-stakeholder. They're saying we're organizing as a system. So what's emerging out of these is actually meta-organizations. The Global Compact, for example, is bringing together the, these other global action networks. The Global Reporting Initiative, focused upon triple bottom line reporting, the Principles for Responsible Investing, which has signatories of representing $32 trillion in assets, the Transparency International, which I already spoke about, and creating network connections between them. Indeed, we can see clusters emerging around specific global areas, uh, issue areas in health, in the environment, and food and agriculture around the world, so that they're creating meta-networks of accountability to a higher standard of action. So what are the lessons here for resilient communities? I want to just briefly touch on six, hoping that they will be helpful for the deliberations today. Many of them will be natural for you from what I've seen of your work. One is nurture steward, system stewardship. It gets beyond, of course, the individual organization, but it depends upon understanding what the system is, where the weaknesses are in it that need attention, and where the high leverage points are. Embed action learning, and this is perhaps the most problematic that I find for most people working in these networks. They're highly oriented towards taking action. They have difficulty actually of widening their perspective of what others are doing to learn from others and reflecting upon what they've learned to continually improve their action. But we have to keep tipped forward into the transformational change because without that future orientation, uh, we are not going to get to that future we want. We have to build cycles of reimagining our future and how to take action around giving life to that reimagined future. We need to, to cultivate system intelligence. That's what I mean by taking, recognizing, as Kenny said, there are lots of people, lots of organizations working on the issues of interest to us. It's about bringing them together to create coherence and systems intelligence so they can be more effective and impactful. And remember that although we're focused upon networks, we're really about tying together hierarchy as well and trying to make hierarchy accountable to a greater common 